And when I was in middle school, the, the boys were all gone by then. So it was just my mom and my daddy and me. And my daddy had a massive heart attack. Um, he pulled through, but he couldn't work for a long, long time. And uh, even now, I remember the day when we lost our family station wagon. Um, I remember how my mother used to tuck me in at night and she'd kiss me on the forehead and she would give me this big smile and walk out the door, close the door, and I always knew what was coming next. She'd start to cry. She never wanted to cry in front of me. This is the time in my life when I learned words like mortgage and foreclosure. And one day I walked into my folks' bedroom and laid out on the bed was the dress. Now, some of you in here will know the dress. It's the one that only comes out for weddings, funerals, and graduations. And there's the dress, and down by the end of the bed is my mom, who's in her slip and her stocking feet, and she's got her head down, and she's pacing, and she's saying, we will not lose this house. We will not lose this house. We will not lose this house. She was 50 years old. She had never worked outside the home, and she was terrified. And she looked up and saw me. I'm standing in the doorway. I'm just a kid. And she looked at me, and she looked at that dress, and she looked back at me, and she wiped her face, walked over, picked that dress up and pulled it on, put on her high heels, and walked to the Sears, where she got a full-time minimum wage job. That minimum wage job saved our house, and more importantly, it saved our family. And I've always thought of this as the first lesson my mother taught me, that no matter how hard it is, no matter how scared you are, when it comes down to it, you reach down deep, you find what you have to find, you pull it up, and you take care of the people you love. That's who we are. It was years later that I came to understand that wasn't just what my mother taught me. It's what millions of people do across this country every single day. No matter how scared they are, no matter how hard it looks, they reach down deep, they find what they have to find, they pull it up, and they take care of themselves and the people they love. That's what we do as Americans. But it was only years after that that I came to understand that same story about my mother is also a story about government. Because when I was a girl, a full-time minimum wage job in America would support a family of three. It would pay a mortgage, it would cover the utilities, and it would put food on the table. Today, a full-time minimum wage job in America will not keep a mama and a baby out of poverty. That is wrong, and that is why I am in this fight. There it is. And understand this, that difference is no accident. That difference is about who government works for. When I was a girl, the question asked in Washington is, what does it take a family of three to make it in America? What does it take a family to have something solid they can build on? What does it take to give a family a toehold in America's middle class? Today, the question asked in Washington is, where do we set the minimum wage to maximize the profits of giant multinational corporations? Well, I don't want a government that works for giant multinational corporations. I want one that works for our families. That's it. Yep. Yep. So, as I said, the boys, they joined the military. It was a path to America's middle class. Me, I always had a different dream. I have known what I wanted to be since second grade. You may laugh. You didn't decide till what, like fourth grade? 
fifth grade in the back, yeah, yeah. No, I have known what I wanted to be since second grade, and I've never varied from it. I wanted to be a public school teacher. Can we hear it for America's public school teacher? Yes, yes. Oh, this is what I wanted, and I want you to know, I invested early. Um, I used to line my dollies up and teach school. I had a reputation for being tough but fair. Um, this was what I wanted to do forever. By the time I graduated from high school, my family didn't have the money for a college application, much less to send me off to four years at university. So like a lot of Americans, I do not have a straight line story. I got a story with a lot of twists and turns. So here's how my story goes. Um, I was a high school debater and I got a scholarship to college. Woohoo! Um, you bet. And then at 19, I fell in love, got married, and dropped out. Woohoo! <laughs> now, I, I chose this. This is going to be a good life. I picked it. But I thought it meant I'd given up on the dream. I thought, that's it. You, you said goodbye to that one, girl. And we're living down in Houston, Texas. And then I found it. 45 minutes away, a commuter college that cost $50 a semester. Think about that. So for a price I could pay for on a part-time waitressing job, I was able to finish my four-year degree. I became a special education teacher. I have lived my dream job. So, um, I love that work. Do we have any public school teachers in here? Oh, we do. Good. Some more? Good. Fabulous. So, I'm going to need you to back me up on this. It's not a job, it's a calling. I love this work. I had four to six-year-olds in special education, and I love those babies. Um, I still remember the work we did, the things we did together. And I probably would still be doing that work today, but my story has more twists and turns. By the end of the first year, I was visibly pregnant. And the principal did what principals did in those days, wished me luck and hired someone else for the job. Okay, so there we go. I am at home. I've got a little baby. I can't get a job. I got to do something. What am I going to do? I will, I will go to law school. <laughs> but I did. Uh, by this time, we're living in New Jersey. And uh, uh, I found a state law school, uh, $450 a semester, baby on hip, headed off, did three years in law school, graduated visibly pregnant. You will discover a pattern to these stories. Um, and in fact, that was Alex, who waited until after graduation to be born. Thank you, son. Um, graduated from law school, took the bar, and practiced law for 45 minutes. <laughs> and then went back to my first love, um, teaching. Uh, I traded little ones for big ones and spent pretty much my whole grown-up life teaching in law school. Uh, other changes in my life about this time, husband number one, hint, it is never good when you have to number your husbands. <laughs> uh, husband number one and I parted ways, but I found Bruce and I've held on to him ever since, so that, one, that story has a good ending. Yes, good man. So, um, here I am, teaching in law school, and I don't know, maybe it's because I grew up in a family that was just kind of hanging on to our place in the middle class. Um, I always wanted to know more about money. So, I learned about and then taught all of the money classes. If it was about money, I was in. So, I taught contract law and commercial law, uh, secured transactions, payment systems, corporate finance, partnership finance, uh, law of debtors and creditors, bankruptcy law, law and economics. If it was about money, count me in. But there was always one central question in my work. 
And that is, what's happening to working families in America? Why is America's middle class being hollowed out? Why is it that people who work every bit as hard as my mother worked two generations ago find the path today so much rockier and so much steeper? And for people of color, even rockier and even steeper. And the answer is like the answer about minimum wage. It's who government works for. Think of it this way. We have a government that works great for giant drug companies. It's just not working for people trying to get a prescription filled. Works great for people who want to make money investing in private prisons and private detention centers down at the border. Just not for the people whose lives are torn apart by those places. It works great for giant oil companies that want to drill everywhere. It's just not working for the rest of us who see climate change bearing down upon us. Yep. <laughs> and when you see a government that works great for those with money and is not working so great for much of anyone else, that is corruption, pure and simple, and we need to call it out for what it is. <laughs> corruption. Corruption. And understand this. The money is everywhere in Washington. Oh, it's about campaign contributions. You bet it is. But it is about so much more. It's about the lobbying and the lawyers. It's about the think tanks and the bought and paid for experts. It flows everywhere through Washington. In fact, I want to tell you one quick story about this. You know, you go back to the early 1990s, we knew what was happening on climate. Scientists were already clear on this. There was no ambiguity. They said putting this kind of carbon into the air is going to destroy this planet. They didn't quite have the timeline right, but they knew what was going on. And here's the thing. You go to Washington, Democrats and Republicans were working together. They were asking questions like, do we need to expand the EPA? Do we need new regulations? Do we need to put more money into cleanup? And then along come the Koch brothers. Hmm, I see you've heard of the Koch brothers. Yes. Along come the Koch brothers and the big oil companies and a few of the big polluters. And they get together in effect and say, wow, if Washington gets serious about this climate thing, that's going to bite into our bottom line. If they really start putting new rules in place, that's going to cut into our profits. So they've got a decision to make. Think about it this way. They've got tons of money. They've got a decision. They could decide, you know, that's it for carbon-based fuels. We're going clean. They don't do that. They could decide, well, um, we need to spend our R&D money on how to pull carbon out of the air. How to pull it. They don't do that. They make an investment. They invest in politicians in Washington. They invest in the rule makers. And they invest with all of their campaign contributions, but in every part of the system, including the bought and paid for experts. You've seen these guys, the climate deniers. You know, I'm a doctor. And as a doctor, uh, I just want to say climate is really important and uh, climate has been here for a long time and the dinosaurs loved it and it was a good time for a salad and, you know, whatever. Do you ever stop and think, why is somebody spending millions and millions and millions of dollars to get these guys to write these reports, to give these guys a platform, to get out there and talk? It's not because folks like the Koch brothers don't understand the science. They understand the science, Right? It's because they understand that these bought and paid for experts can build something very special. They can build an umbrella that the politicians can hide under and keep taking Koch brother money, keep taking big polluter money, keep taking oil industry money. And if they got asked about it to say, oh, gee, I don't know. I'm uh, not a scientist. I don't understand how any of this works, that that would be 
the insulation. You want to understand the climate crisis we face today? It's 25 years of corruption in Washington that brought us here. Yep. And here's the thing about the corrupting influence of money. It touches everything. Whatever issue brought you here today, whether it is around health care or climate or around gun violence, around public education, whatever issue brought you here, if there is a decision to be made in Washington, it's been influenced by money. It's been shaped by money. It's had little exceptions created by money. It's been nudged by money. Money everywhere. And understand this. If we want to fix that system, it's not going to happen with one little statute over here and a couple of changes in regulations over there. No. The only way we fix this is big structural change. That's what it's going to take. Yep. Yep. So how do we do big structural change? I'll tell you where I start, and that is we got to start by fighting the corruption. I'm tired of playing on defense. It's time to go on offense and just run straight up the middle against the influence of money in Washington. You bet. You bet. And I got a plan for that, right? So we're going to do it. So here's the thing. Here's the good news. I have the biggest anti-corruption plan since Watergate. That's the good news. That is the good news. Here is the bad news. We need the biggest anti-corruption plan since Watergate. So you wouldn't be surprised because money is felt in so many different ways. This plan is big. It's got a lot of pieces to it. So I just want to give you a sample, a few of the pieces. Part one, end lobbying as we know it. Enough. <laughs> Block the revolving door between Wall Street and Washington. Enough. Here's one you may never have thought about, but it's important. Make the United States Supreme Court follow basic rules of ethics. You know, they don't do that. They don't do that. I, I could do these all day long, but I'm going to do just one more. Just one more. You really want to hose out some corruption in Washington? Make everyone who runs for federal office put their tax returns online. So that's part one. Attack the corruption head on. Just go after it. Disrupt it. Move things around because that opens up the possibility for so many other changes. Let me tell you where I would love to go next. And that is we got to make some structural change in this economy. We got a real problem. Giant corporations. These corporations that have swallowed up little businesses swallowed up medium-sized businesses. Shoot, they've swallowed up what used to be big businesses, right? And the problem with that is how much power it gives them. Think about it. It gives them power over their employees, power over their customers, power over the communities where they're located, and power to call the shots in Washington. We need a president of the United States who has the courage to enforce our antitrust laws and break these giants up. It's time. Yep. And that's one way we go with this. Another way, we need more balance in the system, and that means we need more power in the hands of workers. We need to make it easier to join a union and to give unions more power when they negotiate. Yep. Unions built America's middle class and unions will rebuild America's middle class. You bet. There's another way we can make structural change in this economy. It is time for a wealth tax in America. So here's my plan. Here's my plan. It's to say for the fortunes over $50 million, you got to pay a two cent 
two cents every year for every dollar over. So it works this way. Your first 50 million free and clear. I can see it, right? <laughs> first 50 million free and clear. But on your 50 millionth and first dollar, you got to pitch in two cents. And two cents on every dollar after that. When you hit a billion, it goes up another penny. But that's the basic idea. And just so everybody's tracking on this, anybody in here own a home or grew up in a family that owned a home? Yeah. You've been paying a wealth tax forever. It's just called a property tax. All I'm saying is for the top one-tenth of one percent, that's what we're talking about here, these big fortunes, your property tax should include not just the real estate, but also the stock portfolio, the diamonds, the Rembrandt, and the yacht. That's the basic idea. It says, come on, guys. Now, I know you're going to be shocked to hear this, but there are some billionaires who don't like this plan. Yes, yeah, they've been talking to each other. Run for president. Um, <laughs> oh. And they've gone on television to cry uh, about how sad it is if they had to pay two cents on these great fortunes. And they make this argument that, you know, I worked hard, so I should get to keep it all without having to help anyone else. And I, I always think, yeah, you worked hard like, unlike anybody else. I mean, a lot of people worked hard. But I get it. You made it. You built a great fortune in America. Good for you. Good for you. You had a great idea. You followed it through. You turn this into something really fabulous. Good for you. But here's the thing. You built a great fortune here in America. I guarantee you built it at least in part using workers all of us help pay to educate. Yep. Yep. You built it at least in part getting your goods to market on roads and bridges all of us help pay to build. You built that fortune at least in part, protected by police and firefighters. All of us help pay their salaries. And we're glad to do it. We're Americans. We want to invest in the basic infrastructure that creates opportunity. We're happy to do it. All we're saying is if you make it big, I mean really big, I mean top one-tenth of one percent big, pitch in two cents so everybody else gets a chance to make it. That's all. Yep. Two cents. Two cents. So here comes the amazing part. What can you do with two cents? Two cents. I'll tell you where I start. Universal child care for every baby in this country age zero to five. Early learning. That's where it starts. Universal pre-K for every three-year-old and four-year-old in America. And we can stop exploiting the largely women, largely black and brown women who do this work, raise the wages of every child care worker and preschool teacher in America. We got some money for it. Two cents. For two cents. We can do all of that for our babies, plus we can make an historic $800 billion new federal money investment in all of our public schools K-12. to Think about that. Quadruple the funding for Title I schools that teach low-income children. Give them the resources they need. For a special ed teacher, you'll hear, you'll hear this one. We can fully fund IDEA so every child with disabilities gets the education they need. First time in history. And one more. It gives us enough money to put a new million dollars into every single public school in America so that public school can be an excellent public school and serve its children. Yeah, this part, it's about the money, of course it is, but it's about the respect and it's about saying, 
Investing in our public schools is how we build a future in America. That's what we can do. <laughs> Same two cents. We can do all of that for our babies, plus we can do all of that for K-12, plus we can provide tuition-free technical school, two-year college, and four-year college for anybody who wants an education. We can help level the playing field and put $50 billion into our historically black colleges and universities. Yep. Same two cents. Two cents. We can do all of that and one more thing. We can cancel student loan debt for 43 million Americans. That's part two. Part one, attack the corruption head on. Part two, make some structural change in this economy. Part three, protect our democracy. We got to do that. Yep. We need a constitutional amendment to protect the right of every American citizen to vote and to get that vote counted. It's time for a federal law to prohibit political gerrymandering. <laughs> and a federal law to roll back every racist voter suppression law in this country. <laughs> and just one more. It's time to overturn Citizens United. Democracy is not for sale. There we go. So there it is. I just want three things. <laughs> Attack the corruption head on. Make some structural change in this economy. And protect our democracy. And for me, those three things are tightly related to each other. Because they address the basic question as we go forward in this country. Are we going to be in America where opportunity is reserved increasingly just for those born into privilege? Or are we going to be in America where every single child in this country has the opportunity for a first-rate education? That's what we can do. <laughs> opportunity. For me, that's the whole ball of wax there. Opportunity is about the fundamental question. It means something different to everyone. I remember, I was a special education teacher. Opportunity may mean the opportunity to live independently. It may mean the opportunity to start your own business because you're not getting crushed by student loan debt. Opportunity to get a good job. Opportunity to love who you love and build the family you want to build. <laughs> opportunity. Because never in a million years did I think I would be standing on a stage like this talking to you folks here in Iowa about this set of issues. But here's the deal. My daddy, he ended up as a janitor. His baby daughter got the opportunity. The opportunity to be a public school teacher. The opportunity to be a college professor. The opportunity to be a United States Senator and the opportunity to be a candidate for President of the United States of America. <laughs> Dream big, fight hard, let's win. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all so much. That you all are great. Uh, we gonna do some questions? We've already got them? All right, let's do this. All right. Hi. Hi. Hi, what's your name? Erin. Hi, Erin. Um, my question is, how do you plan to address the climate crisis and how it disproportionately um, impacts low-income communities? Oh, excellent. Thank you for the question, Erin. Good. 
So let's start here. Um, the climate crisis threatens every living thing on this planet, and we are running out of time. So we've got to attack this problem, not from one angle, not from two, but from a lot of angles, and we've got to do it fast. The urgency of the moment is upon us. You know, the one thing that scares me the most in this area is every time the scientists go back and have more data to put in and recalculate the numbers, we have less time. The problem is more urgent than we thought it was last time. So how do we think about the different ways to deal with it? Well, let me start with um, something I love to say. I will do everything a president can do all by herself uh, on the first day. And that means things like uh, there will be no new drilling or mining on federal lands. We'll respect our Native American tribes, they will make the decisions about what happens on their lands and the adjacent federal lands. Good stewards of the land. Um, that I will do everything I can do through presidential part. Oh, here's another part. How about no coal lobbyists to be the head of the EPA? There we go. There's good ones. But we also have to think about the other tools in the toolbox. And one of the principal ones is regulation. We've got to be willing to take this one head on. Uh, we can't shy away from it. So here's my plan. And that is by 2028, no new building, houses or commercial buildings, they can't have any carbon footprint, zero carbon footprint going forward. By 2030, new cars and light duty trucks, zero carbon footprint. By 2035, electric production, zero carbon footprint. All of this is achievable. We do those three things in America. We cut our carbon footprint by 70%. Three things. Think about that. That's a difference we can make. Do we still need to attack the other 30%? Sure we do. But look how much of a leg up that gives us in this battle. Another part we need to look at is going forward. Even if we bring our carbon footprint to zero, we need to think about the fact that we're only 20% of the world's problem. 20% is a lot, but we need, we need to be the leaders around the world. Problem is, we are the leaders around the world. We're just leading in the wrong direction right now. We're giving a lot of cover to the countries that don't want to have to do as much, don't want to have to spend the money, don't want to have to take the politically courageous path. So what should we do around this one? I've got an idea around this. And that is there's estimated to be about a $17 trillion market going forward around the world for green. Green production of energy, cleaning up the air, the water, desalinization, right, all in this path. And here's the thing. Most of this stuff has not been invented yet. We're kind of on the edge. We have some ideas, but we're not there. So here's my plan around that. A tenfold increase in what we spend in research and development. Let's do best what we do best as Americans. This is where we're good. And now comes the next part. And that is to say, you can build what we invent so long, and no, no patenting on this, you can build it, but you have to build it here in the United States of America. <laughs> American taxpayers pay for the research, American taxpayers get those jobs. That one is estimated to produce about 1.2 million new manufacturing jobs right here in America, good union jobs, good green jobs going forward, and gives us more allies in this fight. And then here comes the third part, and that is we build this stuff here in America. We need to sell it or even give it away all around the world because we need everybody using what we come up with. So we need to show this leadership around the world. And just to give you a little piece on this, right now, you know, other countries market their products. For every dollar America spends marketing our products around the world, China today is spending $100. So how about we increase our marketing budget on this particular issue, on selling green around the world? I think that's a key part of it. And then one more part as we think about climate. And it can't just be a tack on, as some people have done. And that is, we need to think about environmental justice in this country. You know, understand this. 
generation after generation after generation. The polluting plants, the dumps, have all been put near communities of color and far away from white communities. That has had a profound impact on the health of people of color and on the economic circumstances they face because it destroys the value of that property. So here's my proposal. I've got about a $3 trillion that I want to spend in this area. It's not enough just to say we're going to do better. We have to make environmental justice. That means cleaning up what we have done for decades and decades and decades. A central part of our climate plan and making the economic investments so that communities that were burdened become communities that have a chance to thrive. So my plan is to spend about a third of that money to commit it to environmental justice to the communities that have been left behind, the communities that we really owe a serious obligation to. Okay? So I know this is already a long answer, but I want to give you one more little part to it. Those are just the biggest pieces, as you can imagine. Go to ElizabethWarren.com and you'll see some more, a lot of things about climate, including the importance of bringing in our farmers so that our farmers can be not part of the climate problem, but part of the climate solution, making it economically possible for them to do sustainable farming, to be the good stewards of the land they want to be. I think that's critical. The question you should be asking yourself, though, on climate goes right back to what I was talking about earlier, and that is, why haven't we done it? And the answer goes back to that same point, corruption. And understand this, anyone who talks to you about climate and doesn't talk about corruption, anyone who talks to you about climate and doesn't talk about how we have got to stop the influence of giant oil companies, stop the influence of the Koch brothers, stop the influence of big money in Washington is not serious about change. Because change only comes if we've got the power, if we've got a government that's not just working for a handful of powerful and wealthy industries. Change is only going to come if we make this government work for the rest of us. So that's why we got to be in this fight all the way. Thank you. That was a great question. Great. Hi. Hi, I'm Tim. Hi, Tim. Um, my question is, how can we reach out to friends, family, coworkers that uh, are m less progressive um, and think they, they don't trust government? Sure. And they think that taxes are one of the biggest ills in their life. And, that, uh, and how do we convince those people to vote for big structural change? Good. I like the question, Tim. So let me start with, talk to them about corruption. Corruption is not something that just Democrats have figured out. Corruption is about reframing how we think of the entire issue going forward in America. America today is actually much less about left-right politics. I know that's how the pundits line it up. I know that's how it always sounds on television or in the papers. But it's much less about left-right and much more about the guys on top who just are getting richer at a faster and faster rate, and everybody else. And when I talk about that in any crowd, Democrats, Republicans, independent, everybody nods. Everybody gets it. It's a starting place to talk about what's broken. And then part two, here's my recommendation. Talk to them about what we can do for two cents. Talk to them about the wealth tax. Because here's what we know about that wealth tax. Not only do Democrats like it, Independents and Republicans like it. Why? Because they get that they're getting ripped off. They understand this. In fact, let me give you a stat you can use. This may be helpful. Remind your friends uh, and family uh, that this year, the 99%, which might include some of the folks you know, right? Might be some of the people in here. The 99% is on target to spend, on average, about 7.2% of your total wealth in taxes. The top one-tenth of 1%, one they'll spend 3.2%. Think about that. 
even if we ask them to pay two cents more, they're still coming out ahead. I am tired of freeloading billionaires, right? We need to ask these guys to pay a fair share. And then just talk to them about what we can do with two cents. That we built a great country because we invested in public education. We built a great country because we invested in our children and the future. And I find, now look, remember the three boys I talked to you about at the beginning, my three brothers? Only one is a Democrat. Do the math, right? But all of us care about our kids. And we care about how to build a future in this country. So I'm hoping to talk to them about corruption, talk to them about the two cent wealth tax, and then talk to them about just asking those guys to make an investment in our future, that that may be a place where you can get a little common ground and get it going. Does that sound like it might work, Tim? Let's give it a try. Okay, thank you. That's good. I like that. I like that. Hi. Hi, I'm Scott. Hi, Scott. Uh, many of us are nervous about the impeachment inquiry. Uh, mm -hmm. While we believe the president has committed, commu uh, committed impeachable crimes, it appears the process has become partisan uh, as an affair. What would you do as president to ensure that the checks and balances outlined in the Constitution are maintained and perhaps strengthened? Oh, so that okay. Doesn't happen again? That's a good question, Tim. Uh, let me start here. Uh, as president, I will not break the law. Okay, uh, that's a good starting point, but let me, let me say this about, about the impeachment process. Um, when I first made the decision to run for president, I never in a million years thought this impeachment was going to be in the middle of this. I thought it was going to be about corruption, uh, that we've had a problem for decades now in America with the influence of the wealthy and the well-connected, and in Donald Trump's administration, it's just taken off like crazy, this is the most corrupt administration in living memory, right? So I thought that's what this was going to be all about. So then the Mueller report came out. I read the Mueller report, all 442 pages of it. And I got to the end, and there were three things that were clear. And I mean clear, if you've read it. it because they had the affidavits in it, they had the footnotes in it, all of the documentation. Part one, a hostile foreign government attacked the 2016 election for the purpose of helping Donald Trump. Part two, as a candidate, Donald Trump welcomed that help. And part three is when the federal government started to investigate part one and part two, as president, Donald Trump did everything he could to obstruct that investigation. And there are 10 items laid out with all the documentation. I got to the last page, 442 pages, and I said, it's clear to me we need to begin an impeachment proceeding. Because if we don't, he will break the law again and again. It's not about politics. It's about the basic notion in our Constitution, no one is above the law, not even the President of the United States. So I called for impeachment at that point. I said, I don't want to make this about politics. Come in and let's do this based on the Mueller report. We didn't go there as a, uh, the House didn't do that. And sure enough, in the summer, it turns out, it's pretty clear, the evidence seems to show that Donald Trump broke the law, uh, tried to get uh, the Ukraine government uh, to do things that would be a personal favor to him, a political favor to him, and used American taxpayer money and a visit to the White House as the bait to make that happen. Uh, and then, when called out on it, Evidently did it again in September, uh, at least made a very public overture to China, right? And has done everything he can to obstruct the investigation, telling people they can't testify uh, and trying to block access to documents. So for me, this one is just not about politics. It can't be. Um, this is about the oath of office that I took and every single person in the House and the Senate and that is to uphold the Constitution of the United States of America. I don't come to this with any pleasure, but I come to this with the seriousness that this moment requires. And 
that means if the president breaks the law, and that's what the documentation shows, he's been invited either to come in person or to send his representatives to defend himself. But if there's not anything new there by way of defense, then I think we have an obligation to go forward. And I understand there are people who say politically you'll never get the Republicans to move. Look, they took the same oath of office I did. They didn't take an oath of office to a political party. They didn't take an oath of office to a particular person as president of the United States. They took an oath of office to uphold the Constitution of the United States. So for me, we need to do this as soberly and with as much um, uh, care as we possibly can. But I think we have to go forward on impeachment. I just don't see any way around it. Yep. So, I am so glad you all are here, and I appreciate your being here. I want to do one more thing, and we'll, we'll wrap up and we'll do selfies for anybody who wants to. Um, I want to tell you a story as we close, and that's a story about a toaster. You did not see that coming, right? <laughs> you didn't expect a story about a toaster, right? Okay, so here's the story about a toaster. When I was a young mom, uh, toasters could start house fires. Uh, those little toaster ovens, you know, the kind with the little pull-out tray, um, they didn't have automatic shut-off switches after so many minutes. Oh, yeah, your eyes got big, right? Uh, you could put four slices of bread in one of those, flip it on, hear the baby cry, go to the other end of the house, stay down there with the baby a little longer than you thought you had, and when you came back to the kitchen, the flames would be leaping up eight to ten inches high off each slice of toast. Uh, and with any luck, you could catch the kitchen curtains on fire, the kitchen cabinets, and you see how this goes. Ask me how I know. <laughs> All I am willing to say is that uh, one year when I was a young mom, my daddy bought me a fire extinguisher for Christmas. <laughs> okay, so federal agency came along and said, enough. You can't sell toasters that could have a one in five chance of burning somebody's house down. They put automatic switches, shut off switches on the toasters, and that was it. No more house fires from toasters. By 2000 in America, mortgages had gotten so complex and so dangerous, they had a one in five chance of costing people their homes. Not through fire, but through foreclosure. Only this time, the federal government was not on the side of the people. It was deep in the pocket of the banks. In fact, so deep, they let them keep selling these mortgages until they crashed the entire economy, and that was 2008. So I had an idea for a federal agency that would be like the federal agency on toasters, but instead of physical products like that, it would be a federal agency that said mortgages, credit cards, payday loans, uh, student loans, you, you can't cheat people on these, you can't trick people on these. So. I went to Washington, I wasn't in Washington, I went to Washington and talked to as many people as I could about this plan. And I, just anyone I could get. And mostly they told me the same two things. Part one, that is a great idea. You could make a real difference. This is structural change. And two, don't even try. <laughs> nope, you'll be up against big banks, you'll be up against big money. You'll be up against all the Republicans. You'll be up against half of the Democrats. You can't get it done. I get it. Big structural change is hard, but it was the right thing to do. So we got in the fight, and we took on Wall Street, and we took on the big money, and we took on the big banks. And by golly, in 2010, Barack Obama signed that agency into law. We won. Yep. And that little agency has already forced big lenders to return more than $12 billion directly to people they cheated. We know how to make government work for the people. We can do this. So here's what I learned from that experience. I learned that even if the big banks don't like it, even if Wall Street doesn't like it, even if the big donors don't like it, 
We need big ideas to solve the big problems in this country. We need big ideas to inspire people, to get them out and caucus and get them out and vote. We need big ideas to be the lifeblood of our party so everybody knows who and what Democrats will fight for. We need big ideas to take back the Senate and put Mitch McConnell out of a job. We need big ideas and we need to be willing to fight for them. Now I understand it's easy to sound sophisticated by giving up on a big idea, saying, no, we can't do that. But when we give up on big ideas, we give up on the people whose lives would have been touched by those ideas. And those people are already in a fight. People who are struggling to pay their medical bills are already in a fight. People who are getting crushed by student loan debt are already in a fight. People who are getting stopped by the police because of the color of their skin are already in a fight. And those fights are our fights. <laughs> our country is in a crisis. And media pundits, uh, uh, Washington insiders, even folks in our own party don't want to admit this. They think that running a big campaign that nibbles around the edges of our problems is somehow the safe strategy. If the best that Democrats can offer is business as usual after Donald Trump, then Democrats will lose. We win when we have solutions that match the problems people face in their lives. Look, I'm not running a campaign based on um, a, a bunch of uh, consultants shaping it and uh, coming up with some proposals that are designed not to offend big donors. I passed that one a long time ago. I'm running a campaign based on a lifetime of fighting for working families. I'm running a campaign from the heart because I believe that 2020 is our time in history. That 2020 is our time to win the fight for a Green New Deal and save our planet. Twenty twenty is our time to win the fight for Medicare for all and save our people. And twenty twenty is our time to win the fight for a two cent wealth tax and make an investment in an entire generation of young Americans. And if you think that twenty twenty is our time. If you believe that, then I'm asking you, caucus for me. Commit today to come to the caucus, be part of this fight, because the only way we're going to get this done is when we build a movement. It's not going to happen by asking the billionaires. It's not going to happen by sucking up to the corporate executives. It's going to happen if we build it ourselves. This is our time to take back our democracy. This is our time to dream big, fight hard, and win. Thank you. All right, everybody. Uh, so now it's time for the moment you've all been waiting for, selfies. All right, so what I want everybody to do is if you want to get a selfie, please line up by this column over here. Uh, Ryan is waving his hand. Uh, please allow, if, you have, if there are families that want to get a picture, please let, allow them to get to the front of the line, just like on an airplane. 
But thank you all for coming. Please make sure if you want to get a picture, please uh, line up over there by the column. Thank you so much.